to Abby Spanberger, who was a CIA operations officer, or Elaine Luria, who was a naval surface warfare officer. Um, it goes on. These are very moderate um, members of the, of the, of the caucus. Um, look, we're in a presidential primary environment, so there will be presidential candidates who want to distinguish themselves by going hard to the left. That's just the nature of primary politics. But um, that's point one. Point two, you mentioned anti-Semitism, and this, this deserves a, a moment and some clarity. Um, I'm a little embarrassed, quite frankly, with the week that we spent um, negotiating the response to Congresswoman Omar's statement. And I think people in the room will know that twice now she has, on Twitter, made statements that incorporated old anti-Semitic tropes, that people who advocate for Israel are have dual loyalties, um, that the last one was about, it's all about the Benjamins, associating money with the pro-Israel lobby. Um, that is inexcusable full stop. Anti-Semitism is inexcusable full stop. And I'm a little embarrassed that we spent a long time, and I'll share this with you, you're my constituents. I think Nancy Pelosi has by and large done a pretty good job keeping a fairly fractious group of people together, but I think she lost control of that one. Had I been the speaker, and I'm not the speaker, and that's probably for a very good reason, or at least a couple of very good reasons, I would have said to Ilhan Omar, hey, this is number two. You go onto the floor, you give a speech apologizing for what you said, if you do it again, I'm taking you off your committees. End of story, let's move on. Instead, we came up with a resolution, and of course, once the resolution existed, not it couldn't just be about anti-Semitism, it needed to be about Islamophobia, and now we're having a very <coughs> academic discussion, none of which was wrong. You know what, we should stand up against Islamophobia and, and all the other stuff. But this was a moment for clarity where we say that kind of language does not work, and, 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 and leave it behind. Um, I do want to assure you, um, I hear this, and the Republicans are, are working pretty hard to create this notion that all of a sudden the Democratic Party is anti-Semitic. It is not. It is not. I will be delighted to go into more detail about that if, uh, if anybody wants. Thirdly, and lastly, um, it shouldn't be just the Democratic Party that is worrying about um, a trend in this country of income and assets more and more going to a very small group of people. Um, I sound, I understand that I sound like I'm well left of center when I talk this way, but the fact of the matter is that so many Americans that used to be middle class now feel like they can't be middle class, that our politics are warped, that we, that the political energy is around a Republican, supposedly Republican billionaire whose message is you're getting screwed, the system is rigged, or around an el elderly Vermont senator who says the system is rigged. And I'm not trying to take personal shots at either one of them, but their message is that the system is rigged against you. And the problem with that is that it's not entirely untrue. Because 50 years ago, if you had a high school education, there was a mill you could walk down the street to go to work in and you'd be reasonably middle class, and you could educate your kids. More and more, those mills are all gone. In places like Ohio, or Shelton, Connecticut, or Oxford, Connecticut, they're gone. And people who sort of expected to live the American dream are now working at the Walgreens for $12 an hour. And we've got to address that, or we will have political problems that make our political problems today look pretty easy. And so I don't happen to believe, I disagree with Alexandria Cortez that 70% top marginal tax rates are the, are the way to address this, because you know what, the really, really wealthy in this country don't pay top marginal tax rates, they pay capital gains and dividends. So anyway, I'm happy to engage in this conversation, um, but we do need to collectively struggle with the fact that the number of Americans who really feel like they're benefiting from their country is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so, we got to sit up and listen to some of their, the concerns of what you characterize as the far left, even if we don't necessarily agree with all of their prescriptions. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Nancy. I'm from Stanford. Um, during the 2018 run-up to the election, everyone was on TV for the Democrats talking about redoing health care. Day after, nothing. So everyone disappeared from TV. Nobody's been talking about it. And it would really help everybody 
if people went back on TV and started talking about it, and you're in the Financial Services Committee, you must see things there that are um, relative to, excuse me, relative to it. And I understand that, for especially for Connecticut, it's a very sensitive issue because of the amount of insurance in the state. But and and, and it's one sixth of the U.S. economy. But something has to be done that brings down the cost of drugs, brings down the cost of going to a doctor or an emergency room visit. And that's just one. And what else are you seeing in the Financial Services Committee that we don't hear about because you don't go on TV anymore? <laughs> <laughs> You're being sarcastic about me not going on TV anymore. <laughs> okay, I go on TV a lot. I, I don't often go on TV on the question of healthcare, but being on the Intelligence Committee gets me on TV a lot. Um, so, okay, two very different questions there. Let's see if I can deal with them pretty quickly. You couldn't be more right about the challenge associated with, and we talked about this a little bit before, expanding coverage, making sure people have access and affordable access to healthcare. So I don't want to repeat myself, but um, I am supportive of efforts to allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices with the, with the pharmaceutical companies. That would help. We talked a little bit about, I talked a little bit about the good part of this, which is, you know, changing our healthcare system to a system that actually spends money on keeping people healthy rather than fixing them when they're not when they're not healthy. Um, the insurance companies are a fair are a fair conversation. Um, some of the supporters of single payer say, hey look, single um, insurance companies take a good chunk of profit out of the system and that's morally wrong. That's their argument. And there's something to that. And they also point out that unlike in the Medicare system, you know, executives in the insurance companies get paid Get, get, get paid a lot of money, that's not true in, in, in Medicare and Medicaid. So that's a fair conversation too. Now, I'm not sure it gets to, I'm not sure it solves <coughs> the hard thing that insurance and Medicare have to do, which is um, insurance companies and Medicare and whoever decides what gets covered has a very hard thing to do, which is to tell people no. Um, doctors will tell you that um, Nothing is quite so dangerous as somebody who comes into their office who spent 17 minutes on WebMD. <laughs> so we go to our doctors and we know what we need. And doctors, you know. So my point is that right now people get very angry at insurance companies because insurance companies sometimes deny care. If we had Medicare doing that, Medicare would also play that role. So anyway, um, you asked about health insurance. And I do think the project of the next 10 years is to figure out ways to the costs um, of our healthcare system because they ultimately get reflected in our premiums. You asked about financial services and where the financial services committee is going to go. Um, it's going to go in a very different direction than it was in the last Congress. Those of you who follow Congress know that Chairwoman Maxine Waters is a very different person than Chairman Jeb Henselin. <laughs> you can't sort of pick a larger ideological distance than between those two. But um, and and Maxine Waters is a she's a she's a fighter. Um, and so every once in a while, the fighter aspect of Maxine Waters is going to appear. Um, but she cares deeply about homelessness and about housing. So I think the committee is going to, for the first time in a long time, be given over to how can we do more affordable housing at every level. Homeless right up to workforce housing, something that is really important in this part of Connecticut because housing is such an expensive thing. So you're going to see a lot on housing, which I think is good and exciting uh, for this area. You're going to see a lot on consumer protection. Um, we've fought a rear guard action in the last six years to try to preserve, preserve the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. It's been under assault um, for a long time. So Maxine is really going to take the committee in the direction of protecting consumers from things like payday lending and all the other unseemly stuff that happens out there in the financial services area. Um, what you're used to seeing is efforts, uh, when the Republicans had the majority, they did much like Dodd-Frank. We saw effort after effort after effort to reduce, eliminate, trim back Dodd-Frank. You're not going to see a lot of that um, under under Chairwoman Maxine Waters. Yes, sir. Um, good evening, Congressman. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name's Luke. I'm a senior at the King School here in Stanford. Um, I just, so thank you for bringing up transportation. Very interested in transportation. I study transportation. I work in the transportation field. Um, in turn, the transportation field as well, high school. Um, so you brought up transportation before, and obviously the state of our transportation is decline compared to you know other developed world um, countries in Europe and Asia to really you know Middle East for instance um, so where do we get the funding structure for this because President Trump has the trillion dollar plan but it's only 
a $200 billion in federal money, $800 billion in private partnerships with um, corporation, um, you know, just different private entities. And I just, and obviously the highway trust fund's gonna be insolvent in a few years, and that's where we get the majority of our money from through the gas tax. And obviously in Connecticut, we're dealing with our own funding issues for uh, um, highway funding. And I just, yeah, so basically different funding things. Like for instance, the Gateway Project in New York City is being stopped by the Department of Transportation. So general overall funding and transportation. Yeah, things. yeah, thank you. Um, okay, uh, yeah, th thank you for asking the question in that form. Um, so everybody agrees we need to invest in our transportation infrastructure. Hey, nobody disagrees with that, yay. Where the conversation gets difficult is how do we pay for it? And that was your question. Uh, and that's a really good question. So let me, in the spirit of moving along fairly quickly, let me touch a couple of areas. Traditionally, we of course paid for our transportation infrastructure with the dreaded gas tax. Well, the gas tax hasn't been raised in many, many, many years. Um, and oh, by the way, fewer and fewer vehicles are burning gas today, of course. We have hybrids and, and, and electric cars. And so, uh, but nonetheless, that's a powerful source of revenue and it should be on the table. Um, I, I'm not gonna get too detailed here, but there's such a better way to do this than we do it. You know, gasoline prices go up and down. As gasoline prices rise, a penny or two should come off the gas tax. As they fall, a penny or two should be added onto the gas tax. So there's ways probably to do this in smarter ways than we, uh, uh, than we do it. What else? Um, we, of course, are having a very vibrant conversation about tolls, and I'm not gonna go there because that, that decision lives in in Hartford, you'll have your opinions, and I understand it's a disruptive thing. Um, fine, oppose tolls, oppose the gas tax, propose a different revenue source, or don't tell me to invest in infrastructure. So that's where the hard conversation is. So tolls, again, I'll leave that behind, because that is gonna be a decision that Hartford uh, makes, and people like Senator Leone. Um, a national infrastructure bank, you know, right? You, guy, guy does the, the, good, the good job of introducing him, and, and, but anyway, that's a Hartford decision. Um, a national infrastructure bank. Um, this is something that's been kicking around for a very long time, where the government would fund a bank that would then borrow money in order to invest in projects. That's one of the, the ideas that would get you into the many hundreds of billions of dollars of available capital neighborhood that you need. Idea number four, and let me cut it off at four just in the spirit of getting to other questioners. Public-private partnerships, I think you alluded to them. Um, they don't work everywhere. You're not gonna build 30 miles of uh, interstate highway in Iowa with a public-private partnership. But right now, the disaster, if you've flown into LaGuardia anytime recently, um, that's a public-private partnership. Now, I know that's not the best selling point, but we're not putting a lot, we need to, we need to fix LaGuardia. But my point is that you know, airports produce an immense amount of revenue, not because they land and take off planes, but because they basically become retail facilities. And so the retail in an airport can help fund the reconstruction of the airport through things like public-private partnerships. So again, there's four ideas, there are, there are others. The thing I care most about is, 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 by all means, object to one of those revenue sources, but, pro but propose something other than simply borrowing. Borrowing is not a revenue source. Borrowing is just saying, I don't want to deal with it, so down the road other people are going to pay for it. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Jenny, thank you for being here. So um, first to address the one comment about um, the social left rhetoric, while the, the rhetoric it might be to the left right now, in reality the policies are very conservative still, that the policies under Presidential Obama, President Obama and Trump are not that different, and um, I think about tax expenditures, like currently we spent $1.5 trillion on tax expenditures, but the debate is all about social welfare programs, which are only 9% of the federal budget. Um, an issue that I care a lot about is indigenous rights. Um, since Connecticut has a history of um, genocide of the Pequot Indians, and currently the, lo the longest standing tribe, um, the Golden Paguasa tribe, is um, it's a, a big struggle to get their land. Um, and I would say, uh, after going to Israel as a Jewish American, that the, the reality of Palestinians is very similar to the reality of indigenous people in the US. And so I definitely commend um, Re Representative Omar for being bold. Um, I really hope that there's human rights to everyone. And so really my question to you is, what can you tell me about what's 
being done um, in Connecticut and about indigenous rights. Are there any bills to, to make it so their treaties are maintained, um, to make sure that they're not banned of speaking their languages in schools, um, stuff like that, thank you. Yeah, gosh, there's a lot there. <laughs> I, I, I really object strenuously to the idea, and let, let, I, I will comment as much as I can to the question of indigenous rights, but I really, again, I'm here in official capacity, but I object strenuously to the idea that, um, that the policies of the last president look anything like the president, the policies of this president. Um, thank you. Yeah, and thank you for the way you asked that question. Um, immigration is one of the most, um, polarized conversations we have today, so I really uh, respect and thank you for the um, way you asked that question. And, 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 and let's be clear about this. We are a nation of laws, and, um, and uh, having 11, 11 million undocumented people in this country is not a reflection of either competence or of being a nation of laws. Part of the reason I'm thanking you for asking the question the way you did is I usually start with the proposition that, yeah, we got a problem when we have as many undocumented people in our country as we do. But let's not dehumanize those people, and sometimes the rhetoric dehumanizes um, those folks who are here. Um, but you, you, asked, you asked the question, and I, and I think exactly the right way, which is that um, our immigration system is a mess. It is a mess. Um, it's a mess partly because um, uh, we don't do much to crack down on employers who will hire the undocumented. I, I've been saying this for years. I don't care how big the wall is you build. So long as there's a guy in Stanford with a contracting business who's gonna pay an undocumented person 10 bucks an hour, which is 10 times more than that individual makes in Honduras in a day, that individual is coming here. So to me, if you really wanna deal with the problem, you find out a way, you find a way, we, we, call it, we had a good bill a couple of years ago um, that would give every person who's entitled to work here the way to verify that they're entitled to work here. Um, you know, technology today, we can do that. And the employers, the contractors, the construction guys, the restaurants, the janitorial shops that hired, we come down hard on them. Because as long as they're hiring, we're gonna have that problem. So to me, that's where we ought to be having the conversation. Uh, okay. <laughs> and, 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 but by the way, um, we can do better at the border too. Um, uh, the president is fond of pointing out that a lot of drugs come across the border, and that's true. The vast majority of drugs come across the border at points of entry, meaning, you know, stashed underneath somebody's chassis in the truck or whatever it is. And so sign me up for more people and more technology in those ports of entry to stop those drugs, the cocaine. And the, so sign me up for that. Um, one other idea that is different from a wall. If we want to, we can stop these, uh, if we wanted to spend the money. We could spend years stopping people who are coming out of El Salvador and Honduras, up through Mexico, living experiences that none of us ever want to think of a human being living. If we really want to stop that, we're actually gonna work with some of these countries that are generating the violence and the horror that caused these people to do what you and I would do. If our daughter was at risk of being raped by the gang guy down the street, or there was drugs in the street, or my brother got killed, we'd leave too. So that sounds a little mushy, I got it. It's hard to deal with drugs and violence in places like in El Salvador and Honduras, but we can do it. So all I'm saying, I'm, 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 I'm giving you things that I think would be consistent with everything you're saying and address the problem. Um, <clears throat> a wall just isn't gonna do that. So that's why I object to the wall as itself. Then we have the constitutional issues about whether the president should be allowed to go around the Congress. But I hope what we're having now is a pretty reasonable conversation about stuff we could do to deal with this problem because uh, that's how we're gonna solve it in the, in the long run. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> oh, Bob Dixon, I wanted to go back to the Green New Deal, which I think is a little, I'm not that young anymore, but got great hair and stuff. But I think as a concept, as a agenda item for framing activity in the House, it's a very, essentially a game changer. It's changed the debate about climate change and economic inequality very quickly and put a lot of pressure on 
Speaker Pelosi, and I do seem a little disturbed that you sort of seem to be waffling on it. I mean, what is your sort of alternative agenda to the Green New Deal that was sort of put this stuff on the front page of the newspapers instead of on section D23 of the, of the Times, like it gets, gets buried all the time. And particularly with the emphasis on communities that are most vulnerable, um, we thought we had a bed during standing here, but we got very lucky actually, and it could have been much, much worse. So the next big storm could hit Fairfield County very hard. And if we're not prepared, if we don't have the resources, we'd have the economic inequality that we do with things. This is a way of talking about various issues together at once. And you just kind of walk like my pink and part of oh, I don't like this sentence or that sentence. It's not a bill, it's a framework, it's a concept, it's just sort of an agenda for a multi-year activity in the house where the activity is going to be. So what is your alternative? I didn't really hear you say you had an alternative other than working with coal state senators or oil state senators and the other part. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, good question. Uh, so let me not restate the concerns I have with the New Deal. It's not about the language, and, and as I, I'll say it one more time, much of what's in there, I think, is a set of really good aspirations, urgency in dealing with climate change, um, all sorts of programs and ideas around social justice and economic opportunity. I'm on board. I express my concern with the federal job guarantee. I'm not going to repeat myself. But you asked, what's your alternative? It's not really an alternative, because let's be clear on what the Green New Deal is. It's not policy. Yeah, you said that. It's not policy. It's, it's a statement of aspirations, which are fine, generally. I, I express some concern. As a statement of aspirations, it's fine. Where I, maybe it's just my personality. Where I get excited is actually in the policies that will make that happen. So um, I just recently co-sponsored a bill that would be transformative and that would actually be the single biggest thing that we would do to address climate change. And here's where it gets wonky. It would be a carbon tax, a fully refundable carbon tax. Some people will know what this is. The idea is that you put a little bit of a, a, a premium on carbon energy sources. Yeah, it's the gas that goes into your tank. Yeah, it's the coal that the plants burn. But then all the money that comes in from that premium gets returned to the American people, every cent, gets returned to the American people evenly pro capita. Uh, what happens then, first of all, it's a progressive thing because as it happens, wealthier people have bigger carbon footprints. Um, wealthier people fly more, sometimes they fly in private jets, less wealthy people don't. Um, and so it's actually a progressive uh, uh, tax, if you will. Um, and what it does is by making carbon sources of energy more expensive relative to non-carbon sources, wind, solar, nuclear, I know that's gonna start a conversation, um, it would move us very, very quickly to a green and sustainable energy future. So I get really excited about that. Um, I, I just get drawn to policy, and every once in a while I get excited about statements of aspiration. That's important too, but I get really pretty excited about policy. Um, and that fully refundable carbon tax is an example of a policy that I totally support. I'm going to take some trouble for it, because um, even though it's fully refundable, yes, it'll make gasoline a little bit more expensive. Um, but that's going to change. That's how we're going to solve climate change. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the Green New Deal ain't going to solve climate change. I'm just saying it's a statement of aspiration. It's largely fair. It's okay. But where I get really excited is about the policies that we can change that are actually going to fix the problem. So that's not an alternative. It's just kind of where my head is. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Good evening, Representative Hines. My name is Ivy Den, and I'm from Greenwich, and I also volunteer with the National Kidney Foundation. And we thank you so much for your support of kidney issues up to now. Now, um, as you mentioned, you spend time in dialysis centers, so you know how horrible those places are and how horrible it is to be on dialysis. I had a kidney transplant, a pancreas and kidney transplant, so I was a former, former type 1 diabetic with kidney issues. You mentioned type 2s have the majority of kidney problems, and they do, and type 2s are the only going to increase moving forward. And so the, the way to bring down the instances of kidney disease is, as you mentioned earlier as well, like general health and maintaining, getting, getting patients or people to maintain or think about their health 
so they don't develop diseases like this because kidney disease is undetectable. And when patients get kidney disease, it is usually at the dialysis stage, which is when taxpayers start paying me $80,000, if not more, per patient for dialysis. So the way to increase the, or decrease the cost to taxpayers for dialysis is to actually increase living donors and also the immunosuppression drugs that transplant recipients receive. Medicare covers three years of immunosuppressant drugs. One of the drugs that patients take costs $1,000 a month, which is astronomical. And so patients, once they are in, off of the, after the three years, they have to pay for that on their own. And so I was hoping you would propose a new bill that supports the immunosuppression drug coverage for transplant recipients after the three years. Thank you. Um, I mean, I know each other. She's a hell of an advocate on these issues. Um, so I'm gonna suggest that we continue that conversation, not in this room. But um, at this DeVita Center, um, I also learned about how a kidney transplant patient in one of their centers gets about 11 years where they don't have to do dialysis, but it only really lasts about 11 years, and they live with those immunosuppressant drugs and the possibility of rejection. So it, it's very current in my mind, so let's, let's, I know we will. Let's have this conversation on the specifics. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Congressman Hines, thanks for coming tonight. Um, my question is, is really a, a question about the prohibitive cost of college tuitions. Even, even with a decent salary, uh, a family would collapse under the crippling debt. If, if you have one or two kids, I have uh, two children right now that, uh, I, I'm talking about my grandchildren, two, two, they're gonna have three kids in college at one time. Um, you probably know the statistics about the debt of um, college students. The, the uh, latest scandal that came out showed the, uh, the admissions process is floored, to say the least. Um, I think, and, and I'd like your thoughts about this, I, I think the government should, Congress should take a proactive approach. Um, the US government is funding private and public colleges through loans. Uh, these loans are, are, um, <laughs> are not excused. It's the only uh, the thing that uh, a person can't go into debt for. Um, I think it's outrageous, and, and, and I'm very, very concerned. I, I think uh, colleges should have uh, some accountability when they give kids degrees. They can't get jobs. It costs parents fifty, sixty thousand dollars and the, the kid comes out of school, lucky if they get a job, and, and, and I know this for a fact, I have quite a few grandchildren, and um, they get thirty thousand dollars a year. I'm trying to make this as short as possible. But the government should make the institutions accountable, I'm talking about the colleges, public and private getting degrees, there has to be some formula for giving loans out, making the colleges accountable. And, and I'd like to have your ideas on, on what Congress can do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was hoping it would come up. I don't think I've done a town hall meeting in the last four years where this issue hasn't come up, which tells you something about how it's hitting everybody. Um, and by the way, I feel it. I've got one daughter in college and another one about to go um, and the checks I write for college are, are almost four times what I paid 30 years ago. 10 times what I paid. Okay, that's just your little older guy. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so um, I, I, I feel this one. Um, and you're absolutely right. Quite apart from what it means for an individual kid to not be able to go to the school that they want to go to, even if they take on the immense amounts of debt that they take on, that's actually, that's a problem for them, that's a problem for us. A child uh, or a graduate who's graduating with $130,000, $150,000 worth of debt, they're not buying a car, they're 
they're not putting a down payment on a home, they're not eating in restaurants, they are servicing that debt, and that's an economic problem. The solutions are tough, um, and you're right, it's partly about accountability, and Senator Murphy and I are working on a, on, a, on a bill that would try to hold colleges accountable when they raise their tuition prices faster than inflation <coughs> is rising. It's a complicated thing, because of course the federal government can't tell Yale or Quinnipiac or UConn what tuition to charge. We do have one lever, which is that the federal government provides a lot of research dollars to these institutions, a lot, billions of dollars. And I'm all in favor of saying, hey, if you're gonna take a lot of public research dollars, you're not gonna become inaccessible. You're not gonna create a world where every kid is carrying around huge amounts of debt. The other thing, and this is a big topic, so forgive me for not doing it fully, fully justice, but the other thing we gotta do is, is change the way we think about college. We're all obsessed, and I'm guilty of this, four-year college. Every kid's got to go to four-year college. Baloney, right? By the way, you know where there's some secure jobs out there? Plumbers, construction people, data technicians, um, uh, electricians, electrical line workers. These are all middle-class jobs, or better. They're not going anywhere. They're not getting moved to Shenzhen, China. And yet we're out there saying every kid needs to get a four-year liberal arts college education. I think we've got to change our thinking about that a little bit. And then finally, four years. Why four years? What's the magic of four years? At, you know, somewhere between 40 and 70 grand a year. You know, why not? A, why don't we explore things like three-year college degrees or distance learning? Right? You can do everything else, you know, online and stuff. So we got to get creative around how we think about this experience that is so so expensive today. Um, so I'm not doing what is an essential issue quite the justice I would like to, but we got that's the direction we got to start. We got to start going. Yeah, we want to keep student loan interest rates low. We do. Um, but as you point out, you made this point very well, just because student loans are cheap, in some ways that's an incentive for kids to take on more debt and for universities and colleges to charge even more. So that's not the whole answer. Yeah. Thank, thank you for the question. All right, are we getting? I have another concern. Technology is wonderful, but we're gonna have self-driving cars, self-driving trucks, robots at the hospitals, Robots at McDonald's. What is going to, is anybody thinking about re educating these people? Because they're all going to be out of work yep, with yep. robots. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Um, uh, so, all this automation. So, we've had a lot of conversation tonight about people feeling like they're, like the middle class feeling like they don't, um, like they don't have any stake in our economy. I talked about the mills that are all closing down. They're closing down partly because of globalization and the fact that now businesses, you know, they didn't 50 years ago move to Mexico and China, they do today. But automation, automation, thank you for raising that. You go visit a modern factory today, there's nobody working in that factory. There's robot arms and machines and robots. There's, there's like one guy walking around programming these things. And so um, you used exactly the right word, which is, and this gets to the gentleman's question, education. Um, we have got to be training people for the jobs that come when the old jobs go away. Historically, this is the good news, this is the optimism. Historically, this is not a new thing, right? Um, you, you know, two, 300 years ago, there were no factories. Every time technology disrupts employment, it always ends up creating more jobs than it takes away. The problem is they're very different jobs. So the guy who used to weld stuff at a car company, it doesn't do that anymore, but the car company has software programmers, the car company has marketers, strategic guys, international trade guys. And so the magic exists in, in, in making sure that we're training and educating people to have the new jobs that get created. And today we're terrible at that. And it's hard to do for a young person in Fairfield County. Can you imagine what it's like for a 58-year-old coal miner in West Virginia? Um, that's really, really hard, but, 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 but that's the answer. We gotta get serious about, you know, Training people for the jobs that are, and this is to what I said about a four-year liberal arts degree. I have a four-year liberal arts degree. I think it's wonderful, but um, a, lot of, a lot of kids are gonna be economically in a better place if they get trained up on the computer programming or the biotechnology skills, or here's an example. This is fun. We talk about biotechnology and programming. There's a whole category of jobs. I'm just gonna give you one example that nobody had ever heard of 10 years ago. Yoga instructors. <laughs> Yoga instructor. There were yoga instructors 25 years ago. Today we've got tens of thousands of yoga instructors. So you see my point, right? We need to sort of figure out, it's like Wayne Gretzky used to say in hockey, you don't skate to where the puck is, you skate to where the puck's gonna be. That's where our training and education has gotta, has gotta go. Yes, sir. I see we're coming pretty close to the end. 
All right, thank you for taking the time to speak with us, Congressman. Um, so, my name is Dory Zhao, I'm from Darien, and I'm here to ask about something a little bit different. Uh, I wanted to talk about some of the voting rights issues that have become pretty apparent in the country over the past couple of years. It started with the Citizens United you know, Supreme Court decision, but it seems like there have been constant assaults on our rights as citizens. I mean, there was a lot of hubbub about stuff going on in Georgia and Wisconsin the last, the last election, but there's even more issues with large money going into the pockets of a lot of politicians, frankly, and a lot of rich people buying a lot of influence that poorer people could never hope to achieve. I know that there was a bill at one point, HR1, but I don't know where it seems to have gone. It seems to have kind of disappeared. I was wondering what the new Democratic majority in the House might do about this issue and whether there might be an appetite for doing something like repealing Citizens United. Yeah, um, you're breaking my heart because the House passed HR1 but nobody noticed because that was the week we spent having this conversation about Ilan Omar and anti-Semitism and resolution. So talk about stepping on the message. It was such a good bill. It is such a good bill, right? I won't go into the details, but HR1 um, would have would have stopped a lot of the gerrymandering that happens out there. HR1 would have uh, created a federal holiday around uh, election day. HR1 uh, would have stopped a lot of the shenanigans that are happening primarily in the South, but not only in the South. Uh, voter ID, which is a catastrophe in the sense that, you know, we don't have a problem with individual voter fraud. It is a mechanism to disenfranchise people. Anyway, HR1, and it would have, um, it would have taken some steps to reduce the influence of money in our system, um, which is a little bit of a harder topic. And the reason it's a harder topic is we can't repeal Citizens United, because Citizens United is a Supreme Court decision. And Citizens United equated political donations with free speech. So we have two options, both of which I support, because I, I promise you, as the guy who, who has to spend the time raising the money, it's an appalling way to spend your time. It doesn't go into my pocket, as you said. It gets spent to buy TV ads. Um, so we can do two things. We can regulate it. As long as the Supreme Court decision stands, we don't get to reverse Supreme Court decisions. We can regulate it. We can say, if you're going to give $100 million, you're going to tell us who you are. If you're a corporation and you put $10 million in the race, you're going to say, this corporation, we put this money into the race. We're going to forbid foreigners from putting money into our election, Russia, China, whoever it might be. Um, we can do a lot of that stuff, which I do support. Or we can be thoughtful about saying, OK, maybe there's a legal argument. I'm not a lawyer. I don't believe it, but lawyers tell me that maybe there's a legal argument that money is somehow the same as speech. So surely our founding fathers who wrote the Constitution, they were committed to the idea of one person, one vote, not to immense amounts of money washing through the system. So maybe we need an amendment to the Constitution that says that we regulate other forms of speech, we regulate inflammatory speech, maybe the spending of money into our democracy because it gives wealthy people and wealthy entities such more influence than it gives people who are not wealthy, we should think about it differently and it shouldn't be subject to the same protections that your political opinions are. So, that was a little longer than I meant to go on that, but you're absolutely right on all that you say. Collectively, we need to, we need to make it easier for people to vote, not harder. Even here in Connecticut, you know, it's gonna require a constitutional change to get um, early voting. You'll have different opinions on that, but it's not as simple as just snapping your finger or Senator Leone deciding to pass a bill. So anyway, this is something that I think we should really commit ourselves to because we've talked a lot about economics and how people feel economically disenfranchised. I don't go anywhere when people feel, about, what, is, what does my vote count when people are spending $20 million on elections? It doesn't make any difference. That's not a healthy place for this country.